Dr. Joe R. McBride is Professor of Landscape Architecture and Forest Ecology at the University of California in Berkeley. His teaching and research are focused on urban forestry and ecology. In recent years, he has investigated the role of urban forests in air pollution reduction, characteristics of urban forests within different geographical regions, and potential impact of global warming on urban forests in California. He received a BS degree in forestry from the University of Montana, and an MS in forestry, and a PhD in botany degrees from the University of California, Berkeley. He has written 14 reports on eucalyptus in the San Francisco Bay Area, including a management plan for the eucalyptus plantations at the Presidio, reports to the California Department of Parks and Recreation on eucalyptus in various Bay Area state parks, and reports to the Presidio Trust. So I uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Joe McBride. Good afternoon. Uh, in, in 1956, an article in Sunset Magazine suggested that we could drive from Arcata, California to San Diego uh, without ever losing sight of eucalyptus. Eucalyptus had become a part of the California landscape, and Harold uh, Gilliam, the San Francisco Chronicle writer, uh, wrote at that time, the eucalyptus uh, uh, seems and <coughs> indispensable element of the state's landscape. And uh, <clears throat> as indigenous Californian, as the redwoods, the poppy fields, the long white beaches, and the green granite of the high Sierras. Uh, it had become uh, a part of this landscape, uh, which it remains over a period of about 100 years when uh, Gilliam was writing uh, that uh, <coughs> statement about it. What I want to do uh, this afternoon is to talk about the history of the introduction of eucalyptus in California, about the characteristics of eucalyptus plantations, particularly in the Bay Area, how the eucalyptus plantations have modified site conditions, and the degree to which eucalyptus plays a habitat role for a variety of wildlife species, and then say a little bit about the future of eucalyptus in California. Uh, my remarks are going to be based on a series of studies that I've done for state parks and for the federal government uh, here in the Bay Area. Uh, the history of this species uh, can be described uh, in, in four parts. Uh, initially, it was introduced uh, during the gold rush period, uh, and uh, we don't know exactly uh, what the first introduction was. Uh, but many gold miners came to California from Australia, from the gold fields. And in the gold fields of, Cal of Australia, miners used eucalyptus oil to separate the gold uh, from uh, the other uh, rock material uh, that they may have pulverized in the way that mercury was later used in California to separate gold from uh, the, the quartz. Uh, they may have brought in eucalyptus seeds, recognizing that they would need eucalyptus oil. Uh, there was also a general feeling that the much of the California landscape that the 49ers crossed was a treeless landscape uh, in which uh, the uh, addition of trees would be an important factor. And it was quicker to get seeds and trees from Australia than it was from the East Coast. In 1856, uh, there was a uh, tree catalog uh, that was published uh, here in San Francisco uh, by uh, a uh, owner of the uh, Golden Gate uh, Nursery. His name was William Walker, uh, and he offered for sale in 1856 six different species of uh, eucalyptus. And so that's probably the first commercial introduction of the species, but historians believe that miners from Australia might have also brought it in. There was a period in the 1870s in which uh, the planting of eucalyptus was promoted throughout California, and it was promoted uh, to achieve uh, a number of different uh, objectives. It was seen as an important firewood supply for coastal communities. It was seen as a tree that would add to the beautification of our cities, as you see in this poster from Oakland. Uh, it was also felt that it would improve the quality of farmland, uh, 
Eucalyptus was planted in that time as a windbreak. It was also planted to dry out the marshes to help control the malaria problem. Uh, and it was uh, widespread in its planting, uh, both in the Bay Area and in Southern California. A second uh, <clears throat> period of planting occurred from 1906 to 1912. Uh, in uh, 1906, when the U.S. Forest Service was formed, one of the arguments for forming the Forest Service was a predicted timber famine that was likely to occur in the United States by about 1940, based on the rate at which hardwood trees were being harvested. And so uh, the planting of eucalyptus was seen as a way of dealing with this lack of hardwood timber that was sure to uh, <coughs> get the United States uh, in a in about a 30-year period. So a number of companies were formed uh, to uh, buy land, plant land with eucalyptus and uh, rigid uh, eucalyptus plantations in order to meet uh, this future need uh, for timber. And a fair amount of research was done initially as to what would be the most effective species. Uh, those plantations did not pan out in terms of meeting the hardwood needs of the nation uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one was that uh, the uh, eucalyptus globulus, the, the blue gum eucalyptus that was widely planted uh, as a, a young tree is not very suitable for lumber production. A lot of stress associated with uh, the wood that's produced by young trees. The wood that was harvested from the blue gum in Australia was harvested from much older trees and the trees were just sawn too young. And so the market really did not develop. Uh, there was then pretty much an abandonment of the planting of eucalyptus, although we were left with uh, many stands of eucalyptus, many old plantations uh, around our cities. Uh, in the latter half of the 20th century, there was some renewed interest in eucalyptus. It was believed that it had a potential for biofuel, uh, and the Simpson Lumber uh, Company uh, established some new plantations up near Red Bluff, uh, to provide fuel for a, uh, a biofuel uh, facility that they were involved in building. A number of studies looked at the potential again for lumber production on the part of eucalyptus, but this did not spur a large amount of new planting uh, of eucalyptus, but it did sort of raise the question uh, because of the rapid growth that eucalyptus is capable of, would it be possible to utilize various species as a biofuel? Uh, this buried planting from the 1870s until uh, 1912 uh, pretty much focused on six different species in California. In the San Francisco Bay Area, blue gum was the principal species that was planted. Uh, and in Southern California, uh, river gum and red gum, uh, their two uh, red gum species, uh, were, were widely planted. But we also see plantations of sugar gum and women scented eucalyptus and silver dollar eucalyptus uh, that had been planted. Uh, the the uh, the counties along the coast, primarily from Mendocino uh, County South, and portions of the uh, inland uh, counties in Southern California all have uh, eucalyptus plantations that were established either in the 1870s or in that period from 1906 to 1912. Uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, the map on the upper uh, right uh, shows uh, the uh, presence of eucalyptus plantations in the uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area, and then the lower map, uh, the red areas in that map, uh, illustrate eucalyptus plantations in the Oakland and Berkeley Hills. And these are, uh, if you will, a legacy primarily of that planting in the 1906 to 1912 period. Uh, may I now call your attention to the characteristics from an ecological standpoint of these eucalyptus plantations. Uh, these structural characteristics involve tree density, they involve the sizes of trees, uh, and uh, they also will involve uh, tree height. And these are data from a number of studies either at the Presidio or uh, in, in the East Bay uh, looking at the present structure of eucalyptus plantations. And as you can see, the, the density ranges from maybe 150 to 160 trees per acre uh, up to as much as uh, over 1,700 uh, trees per acre. That very high density is a result of 
uh, a freeze that took place uh, in uh, the Bay Area uh, in the 1970s and trees were cut down because of the fire hazard associated with what was thought to be dead trees. And so the high density day is a function of those stumps sprouting after being cut in the 1970s. Uh, on Angel Island, I looked at a number of different uh, plantations uh, and one of the factors I was interested in was the density uh, at which they were planting or the spacing. And that spacing ranged from eight feet by eight feet uh, to as much as 30 feet by 30 feet. I didn't have any information as to what was uh, <coughs> making that decision relative to wide or narrow spacing, but uh, the mobile spacing there was an eight foot by eight foot spacing uh, that would give a, uh, <coughs> a density of about 680 trees per acre. And this uh, eight foot by eight foot spacing uh, is typical of many of the plantations in the East Bay. However, since uh, the trees were initially planted, there's been an ingrowth uh, through uh, sprouting primarily, but to some degree through seedling establishment uh, of eucalyptus. The orange squares on this map uh, represent uh, the original trees that were used to establish a plantation along Mill Creek uh, down in uh, Burley Murray Ranch State Park, south of Hatton Bay. And then the various other symbols indicate where uh, younger uh, eucalyptus trees have become established. And this often accounts for a, a high density within these stands. Now, these eucalyptus stands are characterized by the presence of other plants uh, within the understory of the eucalyptus. And this table uh, summarizes a year-long survey of five eucalyptus stands or eucalyptus plantations uh, in Tilden Park. And uh, the, the species were in 21 different plant families, representing 34 different genera of plants and a total of uh, 38 species. Uh, of those, uh, a, uh, 24 uh, were native species uh, and 14 were exotic species. And the uh, plants indicated by the asterisk in this table were the exotic plants. Uh, if uh, we look at adjacent plant communities, particularly uh, woodland communities adjacent to these uh, plantations, uh, we find that uh, for the oak woodlands uh, in, in Tilden Park, uh, the, the number of families uh, is considerably less, the number of genera less, and the number of species uh, less in, in the oak woodlands of plants. Uh, we also see a difference uh, with comparison of oak woodlands uh, to uh, a second uh, area in uh, Tilden Park. Uh, but uh, in comparison to riparian woodlands uh, in California, the riparian woodlands are, are somewhat richer in terms of species than uh, the eucalyptus. The, the presence of understory plants uh, within eucalyptus plantations depends a lot on the amount of light that reaches the ground. Uh, these are uh, two examples of plantations, one on a south-facing slope, one on a north-facing slope, uh, and uh, there's a difference, of course, in the amount of light falling onto the south of the slopes and uh, at the margins of the slope, more uh, margins of the plantation, more light gets in. On the south facing slopes, I recorded uh, 15 uh, species uh, that uh, were, were present, both at the edge of the uh, plantation as well as in the interior. Only eight species were recorded uh, on the north facing slope. Uh, in the, the edge situation. And this is a list of those uh, species. You can see that there are uh, quite uh, a, a few species that are occurring in the edge environment on the south facing slope that don't occur in the north facing slope, probably because of why. These six species uh, are ubiquitous in the understories of eucalyptus plantations uh, in the East Bay, uh, California Bay, uh, Coast Live Oak, uh, poison oak, California blackberry, uh, bed straw, uh, and chickweed uh, are, are quite common in those plantations. Now, the planting of eucalyptus obviously has modified the site as the trees have grown up due to the shading of the trees, due to the uh, leaf litter falling uh, to the floor of the plantation. Uh, there's a, a, a sharp uh, <coughs> increase 
uh, in uh, the uh, relative humidity uh, in within uh, a eucalyptus plantation as one moves in from the edge. Uh, there's uh, also a significant drop uh, in uh, the levels of light and a slight drop in temperature. So eucalyptus stands develop sort of a marginal edge microclimate uh, that favors a certain group of species, but as you go farther into the plantation, as light levels drop off more, as <coughs> uh, there is some drop in temperature, uh, other species may be favored. Uh, a series of plantations at the Presidio were examined in the 1980s, and they average, on average, they showed a 10% decrease in uh, daytime temperature, a 5% increase in temperature at night, uh, relative humidity was about 5% higher within those eucalyptus stands. Light intensity, 90% uh, lower. Uh, wind velocity, uh, uh, a reduction by about 40%. Precipitation, uh, a decrease in about 12% due to the interception. And fog drip, uh, up 300% because of the large leaf surface area of the eucalyptus collecting fog and eucalyptus. eucalyptus has also an effect upon the soils. Uh, to my knowledge, nearly all of the eucalyptus plantations that were established uh, in the East Bay were established in grassland areas. Uh, and comparison with the characteristics of uh, those grassland soils uh, with the soils beneath eucalyptus plantations generally show an increase uh, in pH. Uh, they show an increase in carbon content, slight increase in nitrogen, increase in phosphorus, a large increase in, in calcium, a slight decrease in magnesium, potassium goes up, and uh, sodium goes up as well. These are based on studies that were done by Professor Paul Zinke uh, at One Angel Island. So uh, from a uh, soil nutrient span uh, point, uh, the eucalyptus is accumulating uh, these uh, <coughs> uh, mineral elements and through the decay of the foliage releasing them back to the soil so that the concentration is growing up. Uh, there was interest in the 1980s by Herbert Baker, professor in the Botany Department of Berkeley, on the potential allelopathic effects of eucalyptus foliage. Allelopathy is a phenomenon in which a plant releases a chemical compound that interferes with the germination and growth of other plants. And it's seen as a, an important defensive mechanism in desert environments and controlling sort of space for absorption of water. Uh, Baker used a, a, a technique uh, that <clears throat> was able to demonstrate that the aromatic compounds released by the uh, decay of the eucalyptus uh, leaves did inhibit uh, the germination of a uh, plant, in this case he was using seeds of uh, cucumbers, which were a sort of standard test uh, species at the time, uh, to show that there was a reduction in germination, a reduction uh, in the growth of the root system. Uh, subsequently, his work has been criticized on the basis of uh, the high concentrations of these uh, chemicals that were released in the closed chambers that he, he worked with. Uh, studies at Santa Barbara have shown that uh, if the eucalyptus litter is removed, if the trees are removed and there's no longer a source of bark or litter, uh, that within uh, two years of typical rainfall, uh, there's no longer any inhibiting effect on the part of the eucalyptus. And certainly for those species that were listed in those previous tables, uh, there's no apparent uh, restriction on the part of their germination or growth uh, by uh, the characteristics of the eucalyptus leaves. Uh, eucalyptus leaves often fall into streams, uh, into creeks, uh, and uh, they become, as would be the leaves of native riparian species, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the beginning of a food chain that goes through a number of different uh, species of fungus as well as uh, a number of <coughs> uh, macroarthropods things like mayflies and thompson flies, uh, and uh, they uh, control, of course, uh, the populations of these uh, stream insects, which have an important influence often on uh, fish population in streams. A uh, graduate student of mine studied uh, the effect of eucalyptus 
uh, on uh, streams in the East Bay in comparison to maybe riparian woodlands. Uh, and he found that there was a greater input, uh, a larger uh, amount of leaf litter falling from the eucalyptus plantations into the streams than occurred uh, in the native riparian uh, zones. Uh, but he also found that the rate of decomposition was greater uh, in uh, this eucalyptus foliage that falls into the stream. And there was no difference uh, in the, the species diversity, uh, no difference in the species richness, nor uh, no difference in uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> I'm hard time reading this, but uh, the uh, <coughs> should, should over here. Uh, pollution uh, tolerance. Uh, oh yeah, pollution tolerance uh, between the uh, eucalyptus uh, fed streams and the other streams. There's been a lot of interest in the effect of these eucalyptus plantations on wildlife species. Um, monumental study was done uh, in <coughs> the 19. Uh, 70s or 80s uh, by uh, uh, Stebbins, uh, professor of uh, zoology at the University of California, Robert Stebbins, and he contrasted over a period of a year uh, the, the use of uh, native plant communities as well as plantations uh, in the East Bay, and one of those that he studied was the uh, eucalyptus plantations. He went out on a regular uh, basis every two weeks to record uh, species that he observed uh, and he found that uh, there were <coughs> a number of bird species that made moderate uh, use uh, of uh, the eucalyptus plantations and a few species that uh, made great use. He recorded eight species that uh, pretty much were uh, quite dependent upon the eucalyptus. Uh, in a similar way, he did not find any mammals that were making that level of use, but he did find that there were reptiles and also amphibians. Uh, these are the bird species that he found made great use of eucalyptus plantations and their use varied uh, in terms of nesting habitat or uh, feeding habitat. Uh, these two reptiles, uh, the southern alligator lizard and the southern salamander also were in this category of making great use of eucalyptus plantations. Although he did not find that there were any mammals that he would categorize as making great use uh, a study uh, that was conducted in Tilden Park a few years later showed that uh, the deer mouse uh, was heavily using eucalyptus plantations as opposed to grassland areas, and uh, the California meadow mouse made little or no use of the eucalyptus plantations. So uh, there obviously are uh, woodland forest uh, <coughs> uh, species like the deer mouse uh, that are able to use that, those plantations. Stebbins uh, concluded uh, his paper with this uh, set of uh, bar graphs uh, in which uh, he uh, <coughs> summarized what he called the attractiveness uh, of these different East Bay Regional Park habitats. And he found that the uh, eucalyptus habitat in terms of the species that were using it was about equal to what uh, he found in the grasslands. It was exceeded by the uh, chaparral uh, as well as by the backwards brushland or soft chaparral that uh, he refers to here. Uh, and of course, uh, the uh, attractiveness of the oak woodland exceeded that of all of these other communities. Uh, eucalyptus has been used by a number of insect species. Uh, we're probably all familiar with the monarch butterfly. Uh, this is a summarization of a report that looked at uh, state and county parks from San Diego up uh, into the Bay Area, uh, in which they recorded uh, the tree species that the monarchs were resting on. And uh, the eucalyptus tree was by far uh, the most commonly used species in these state parks as a place uh, for uh, the butterflies to rest and also to, to get some nectar. There have been a couple of interesting insects that came over from Australia not with the inter initial introduction of eucalyptus, but found their way over here in the 20th century. One of these is the eucalyptus, eucalyptus longhorn boar uh, that showed up in the Bay Area in the 1990s, uh, particularly at Mills College, and began to uh, have a pretty serious effect. Uh, this is a wood boring insect that lays its uh, <coughs> uh, eggs on the surface of the bark. Uh, the uh, eggs hatch and the larvae mine their way into the, the cambium 
uh, and then they spread out from the point beneath the bark where the eggs were laid, and uh, they find their way uh, for some distance, getting larger so that their uh, <coughs> the cavities they create in this island uh, and uh, the flow uh, tend to cut off the water supply uh, from the ground and the sugar supply from the above. They then bore into the wood and uh, pupate and then emerge uh, as adults. Uh, following the, the arrival of the longhorn borer to the Bay Area, as well as to eucalyptus plantations in Southern California, uh, entomologists uh, went to Australia and located a parasitic wasp that lays its eggs on the longhorn borer eggs. And uh, on the right hand side, there's little black uh, specks are wasps that are parasitizing the eggs from the longhorn borer. And that's been pretty effective in controlling the spread of that bee. Uh, subsequently, uh, red gum burp, uh, uh, psyllid, uh, small scale insect, uh, has arrived in California from Australia uh, with uh, considerable impact in Southern California, not quite so bad in Northern California because we use less red gum here than they have in Southern California. And work has been done to try to find natural parasites and predators of this particular insect. The, the future of eucalyptus plantations in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, is going to depend upon successional change, uh, the invasion of adjacent vegetation types, uh, and the uh, uh, potential impact of naturalized pests. Uh, I'd like to talk first about succession. The concept of succession is a concept uh, that uh, basically uh, looks at change over time in vegetation types. Primary plant succession is a type of succession that is initiated on uh, bare substrates, sand piling, piling up along the coast, or volcanic eruption that creates new rock surfaces. Plants will uh, move uh, into those areas, begin to modify the characteristics of the substrate over time, uh, making them more amenable for other groups of plants. And so you have a successive replacement of plant communities eventually leading to a plant community that is uh, in tune with the environment. It's a stable plant community that will replace itself over time. And so if, if we look at the eucalyptus plantations uh, throughout the Bay Area, we're seeing the establishment and growth of uh, Coast Live Oak in the understory as well as, as California Bay. Uh, these, these two species are uh, relatively tolerant of shade in comparison to the tolerance of eucalyptus seedlings to shade. So they're doing very well in the understory, uh, growing uh, to some dimensions in many cases. And in the East Bay where eucalyptus have been removed, uh, and we had understories of coastline oak and California Bay and uh, Oak and Bay woodlands uh, persist. Uh, a number of uh, plantations uh, around the bay have what is called advanced regeneration of uh, oak and bay in the understory, uh, relatively high density. Uh, this is a study that I conducted in Tilden Park looking at five different plantations. And you can see the, the number of uh, California Bay uh, per acre uh, was, was quite high uh, relative to oak. So we might assume that uh, in uh, the absence of any disturbance, uh, these understory plants uh, within uh, the existing eucalyptus plantation uh, will eventually uh, succeed as the eucalyptus themselves die. Uh, an important uh, consideration, of course, relative to eucalyptus is uh, the uh, potential for fire. Uh, eucalyptus uh, plantations uh, support a considerable amount of fuel on the ground as a result of their uh, foliage not being ra rapidly decayed in the bark that exfoliates from the trunk. And so in comparison to something like an oak woodland or a bay woodland, they have many more times uh, the uh, fuel loading uh, than those communities. When eucalyptus plantations have burned, uh, this uh, often results in uh, the sprouting of the trees themselves. They can sprout from the roots. If they're not heated to too high a temperature, they sprout from the stems. Uh, it also stimulates, in part, uh, seedling establishment of the eucalyptus. So we might imagine another pattern of succession if we're unable to control fires, where fires will basically rejuvenate these plantations over time. 
there's been a lot of interest in uh, the potential invasion of uh, native plant communities uh, by eucalyptus. Uh, this is a map of uh, a number of uh, eucalyptus plantations on Angel Island that uh, I investigated in terms of uh, their uh, invading adjacent areas of grassland or coastal sage scrub. Uh, and there, there was invasion that took place uh, over the 100 years or so of eucalyptus occupation on that island. The patterns of, of invasion, however, were quite varied. There were some plantations that hardly moved at all, hardly expanded at all. Uh, there were others that uh, expanded uh, considerably. Uh, the high levels of expansion were usually associated with road cuts where there was no competition uh, from grassland uh, or in areas where prescribed burning had been used and the prescribed burning burned into the eucalyptus stands and that seemed to uh, stimulate seedling establishment along the margin or in some cases where there were noise zones along uh, uh, seep areas where the moisture favored the establishment of eucalyptus. Uh, if, if we look at uh, aerial uh, photographs of uh, eucalyptus plantations uh, in the Bay Area, there's uh, also uh, good evidence that a lot of those plantations are, really haven't uh, changed very much over time. The margins are pretty much the same, and uh, this is probably due in part to the lack of fire or to uh, a relatively dry grassland adjacent to them. Uh, I, uh, conducted a study uh, comparison, comparing uh, the uh, uh, change in areas of different vegetation types in the East Bay. And uh, one of those uh, is eucalyptus on the upper left-hand graph, uh, eucalyptus uh, uh, measured in terms of its coverage on aerial photographs from 1968 to 1997. Uh, that was for uh, the plantations at Anthony Chabot Regional Park uh, the others were are for Tilden and, and Redwood. And if we summarize those, we see that there is has been a decline in the area of uh, eucalyptus. That decline in, in, in part has been due to the removal of eucalyptus. There was a significant removal in Anthony Chabot Regional Park uh, between 1968, uh, and, pardon me, between 1949 and 1968. Uh, but uh, this data uh, suggests that uh, uh, even if there is a natural spread to some degree of eucalyptus, that uh, it really hasn't resulted in uh, any uh, increase uh, in eucalyptus stands uh, in maybe, shall we say, against the removal of eucalyptus. I think that the, the future will depend upon the alternatives that the public sees and the resource agency sees uh, for eucalyptus. Eucalyptus groves have a great recreational potential and there is an interest in maintaining uh, the plantations for that purpose. Uh, there may be increased interest uh, in biomass fuel uh, that would turn an economic eye towards uh, managing uh, eucalyptus plantations for biofuel. And then there is an interest in the removal of eucalyptus in order to reduce fire hazard or to uh, replace it with native plant communities. Uh, we seem to be in a sort of love-hate relationship right now uh, with uh, eucalyptus in California. Uh, it's a time that there's been a lot of interest turned toward uh, our uh, plantations and that argument and that discussion, I should say, is certainly not over. Maybe we can continue it in this room in our question and answer session. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the list of, of people here that were affiliated with many of the studies that I did in one way or another that I can talk about would not have been possible without their contribution. Um, you want to moderate the question and answer Thanks so much. So quickly. <laughs> uh, our thanks to Dr. McBride for his comments here today. <clears throat> we would like to remind our listening audience that this is a program with the Commonwealth Club of California and we're listening to the history, ecology, and future of eucalyptus plantations in the Bay Area with Dr. Joe R. McBride. Now we open the floor to question and answers. Please keep your questions short and to the point. 
Also, please be sure that your questions are, in fact, questions and not statements. <clears throat> I will be passing the microphone around. If you have a question, uh, please raise your hand, wait until you have the microphone, and speak into the microphone as we are recording. So we'll begin the Q&A now. How many uh, eucalyptus species are there worldwide? So we got to discussion last time. Uh, I don't know the exact number, but I've heard numbers of 640. Uh, it's very, very large in uh, genus of plants. They're not all arboreal species. Hi, um, I'm not sure you know about um, fire, but of all the factors that people cite as causing intense fires in, in the world right now, especially in the West. Um, this history of fire suppression, building houses in wild land, urban interfaces, climate change, uh, topography, weather. Um, how would you rate the question of the particular species of a plant as um, a factor in fire? Risk. Well, you know, if you can hold all those other variables the same in terms of the location of the plant, relative to the housing, that sort of thing, and just look at the plant itself, uh, I think that uh, its fire hazard is very much determined by the amount of fuel that it produces that is flammable on the floor, and then a characteristic called a fuel ladder. Uh, a presence of other plants beneath the canopies of the trees that would allow a fire to move from the ground up into the canopies of the trees. And that's a, a, uh, uh, a second factor. A third factor is the tissue moisture content, which determines its flammability of the plant. I'm going to try to go back in front, from the back end to the front so that everybody gets a chance here. Uh, I was curious, um, since eucalyptus is such good firewood, how come it's never been, um, was it ever very popular as firewood since 1870? Yeah, it was popular in some rural communities uh, where farmers planted small woodlots uh, to produce firewood for themselves. Uh, it burns extremely hot. I don't know whether it's it's true, but uh, I have heard uh, rumors to the effect that uh, these anirons that people have in their fireplaces are melted down by eucalyptus because it's so hot. I don't know if that's true or not, but it does produce a very hot fire. And what is locally marketed uh, both in Northern California and in Southern California uh, as a firewood fuel. Uh, at the time that these plantations uh, matured, uh, that were planted in 1906, uh, most people were getting out of heating their homes with, with firewood, going to natural gas, and they just, the market kind of fell out for them. First, I want to say thank you. Your talk was very informative. Um, I was wondering, I don't know if you can put that slide back up about the uh, birds mm -hmm. that uh, live uh, in the um, eucalyptus plantations. And if you could tell us if um, any of those birds are uh, endangered species uh, or, or threatened species. Kind of. One of those birds uh, that uh, makes uh, considerable use of uh, the eucalyptus is a great one now, and it finds a, a great uh, nesting opportunity uh, in uh, the, the eucalyptus. Uh, it is not a rare or endangered species, it is a native species, uh, but uh, its, uh, its range locally uh, has been uh, expanded uh, by uh, the eucalyptus trees. It, just, it was uh, limited by a number of nesting sites. That's uh, the second word from the left. Uh, morning dove is a native species, it's not very endangered, it's a very common bird both in urban areas and in the landscape. Uh, as is the stellar jay, maybe not as much in the urban areas, but again not a very endangered species. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> the white-bellied sapsucker 
also not endangered. Uh, and uh, the Anna's hummingbird, uh, or is that Allen's hummingbird, uh, similarly not an endangered species. I'll have cited flycatcher, another native species uh, that uh, is uh, not endangered. And uh, the remaining of these are all native uh, species, uh, none of which are, are considered rare endangered. Okay. And you don't have the pileated woodpecker. No, that was not a podium. Okay, thank you. You, uh, is it true or not that um, urban forests of Brigham eucalyptus need to be managed by periodic thinning in order for the health of the forest to um, continue or become healthier? And if so, um, what percentage of thinning is uh, Desired. I noticed when you were talking, you talked about just characteristics of various stands, as close as eight, eight feet apart. Is that, for example, ideal or dangerous or unhealthy? I <laughs> mean, didn't make any range of statement about that. Uh, well, uh, our management of the stands uh, really uh, kind of didn't evolve in the United States because of the lack of market value and these stands were left alone. Because they were exotic species, there was no evidence of any uh, disease problems or insect problems in them until fairly recently when the longhorn borer arrived and then the, the uh, warp cellar arrived. Uh, in neither of those cases was thinning considered a, a solution uh, to the problem. Uh, the, uh, the trees seem to grow very well at the high density of 8 by 8 spacing. Uh, so I have really not seen any examples of stands uh, that would be necessarily uh, improved by thinning. Obviously, if you thin the stand, you would give each individual tree more growing space, more resources uh, that uh, it would be able to utilize. But uh, in uh, forestry in Australia and New Zealand, where this is a commercial species, uh, they uh, they don't do things, they just harvest it uh, and, and then uh, grow it back from the sprouts. Yeah, hi. Um, I was in a lecture on Monday night where someone talked not specifically about eucalyptus about trees in general, where they said that there was an advantage in uh, removing trees because trees deplete the aquifers and you want to replenish your aquifers and if you got rid of trees then you would replenish the aquifer. Is that true? And um, uh, is that true? Uh, I don't believe that is true. Uh, the root systems of trees, you know, seldom extend down, you know, maybe more than 20 or 30 feet uh, with maybe some exceptions of some trees in the desert. But, that may go down as much as 100 feet. But most of our aquifers are much deeper than that. And so uh, removing uh, eucalyptus or the redwood forest uh, would, would not, uh, in, in my view, uh, allow the, you know, us to store more water in the aquifers. I think that's misleading. Does the longhorn borer or the lurp uh, attack other species besides eucalyptus? <coughs> Is there concern that now that these those um, uh, species have arrived, uh, that that they will attack native? No, uh, there's no evidence, to my knowledge, that they are attacking other native tree species. They do attack attack other species of eucalyptus, but they are not adapted to our native. Does the uh, eucalyptus plant have a role to play in combating air pollution or climate change? Uh, yes, uh, it uh, has uh, its evergreen foliage that allows it to remove air pollutants 12 months out of the year. Uh, it has a, a quite a large uh, leaf surface area uh, that also contributes to air pollution removal. And then, due to its fast growth and its size, 
it, it is uh, basically uh, <clears throat> sequestering a lot of carbon. So I think it does play a, an important role in air pollution reduction. Uh, Somebody up here. Um, I, does the eucalyptus have any um, medicinal value? Um, I, I'm asking this because when I travel in Italy, I find eucalyptus honey. So in pharmacies, um, and and I, I guess it's an anti decongestive or mm. digestive, and I just wondered if they're not. I'm not familiar with eucalyptus. I'm familiar with eucalyptus as honey. It's very tasty, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not specifically familiar with any of its medicinal items. Uh, eucalyptus oil has been used, you know, as a uh, for skin you know, treatment uh, for a very long time. But I uh, don't know any specifics about honey or other compounds. I'm going to cheat and ask two quick questions. Um, one is some birders have said that there's evidence that um, birds' uh, beaks get gummed by the glucum seed and that it's actually harmful, that the glucum trees are harmful to birds. I want to know if that's true. And then my other question has to do with um, whether when, I mean, in San Francisco in particular, there are um, high, you know, fairly steep hills with eucalyptus um, trees planted on them. And if they, there is thinning or removal of those trees, I'm wondering what impact that could have on erosion and um, flooding, potentially, and also on the health of the forest. Uh, uh I don't specifically know about the, uh, <coughs> the bird beak issue. I have read that, but there was no quantitative data presented in what I read. It was uh, uh, just a statement on the part of a, a, a birder, uh, and uh, it, it may be true, but I, I'm not seeing anything in the literature about that. The removal of, of eucalyptus plantations, of course, would ex uh, expose the ground to uh, more direct rainfall, the interception uh, of rainfall by the eucalyptus trees would be removed and that would accelerate erosion. Also, the, the logging method would, could have the potential for a lot of ground disturbance depending on how they remove the logs or how they uh, cut the trees down. Uh, that uh, is uh, typical of any logging operation. That's where most of the erosion takes place is off of the roads and uh, the various uh, skid trails that result in pulling logs out of the woods. Uh, I think there would be a, a high potential for more than the Thank you. Uh, eucalyptus trees used to line a lot of California highways, less so now. Uh, is there a reason why they're not there now, or uh, do they play a, a role in, aside from beautification and, and wind breaks and so on like that? Uh, I, I don't know that they play any specific role to our highways aside from the, the windbreak, aside from the uh, beautification. Uh, there's been a number of highway projects that where the highways have been widened and they have been taken down. And I think we have considerably less uh, eucalyptus along our roads than we have in the past. I think there's some concern on the part of the uh, Caltrans. Uh, for these trees falling onto the, the highways, and that's been another reason that uh, Caltrans is now beginning to remove redwoods from the Redwood Highway uh, from Santa Rosa up to Gardnerville uh, because of their fear of trees falling on the highway. And I think that's happened to a lot of these trees. Speaking of which, I've heard eucalyptus uh, described as dangerous for two different reasons are usually given. One of them is falling branches, so I'm wondering how are they unlike other trees? Do their branches just sort of shut off more easily? And the other one is how flammable are they? So they burn hot, but do they catch fire more easily? And would the fire would catching on fire depend on the density of the eucalyptus forest or the stand? Uh, they do shed a lot of branches and they are uh, you know, in the spectrum of all tree species that are toward that end. There's many other tree species that 
uh, do uh, lose branches. But that is a characteristic strictly of tuna. Uh, they can be quite flammable uh, in a really warm, dry period. Um, this smell that we're familiar with with eucalyptus is basically aromatic compounds that are released as the leaves get warmer. And uh, that can quite easily ignite if a spark or a flame reaches it. Uh, the density doesn't so much affect uh, the flammability of the tree as it affects the heat that's released when the forest burns. And it's a uh, tree density results in greater accumulation of fuel beneath the, the understory of the eucalyptus. And so that would affect the fire hazards, but not necessarily the flammability. It, it, let me back off on that. Higher tree density might lead to cooler understory conditions, higher rolling humidity, so that fuel might not dry out as fast as in the downstream. The large psyllids that uh, you mentioned and the red gums, have they been around long enough to become a food source for these birds or any others that use eucalyptus? Uh, I don't know the specifics of these birds, but I do understand that the large psyllid uh, is uh, eaten by a, a number of native uh, California species, and woodpeckers were uh, basically uh, feeding on the larva of the uh, one board. So they, they have to, uh, we're supposed to be removing the uh, eucalyptus stands above, above UCSF. Mm -hmm. Has that gone on? I heard no more several years ago. I heard that. My understanding is that that project is currently on hold. And there, I don't know whether any specific plans are moving forward on it, but I can see not A follow up to that. There's a plan to cut all of the eucalyptus in the areas above campus, Strawberry Canyon, Claremont Canyon. Does that make you sad? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know why uh, there's such a um, hatred of the tree species eucalyptus? Uh, no. Theories about that? That really baffles me how this has become uh, such an emotional issue for some people. Uh, and uh, no, I, re I really don't, don't quite understand that. Your slides on succession seem to imply that the natural progression of eucalyptus forest is left untouched would be to back to grassland or? No, back to open bay woodland. And how long, I mean, if some of these stands today were left alone, how long do you imagine that process would take? Is that a couple hundred years? Yeah, I would expect, you know, uh, that maybe 200 to 300 years before that took place. This species in Australia lives 250 years, so it has a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Following on from that question, you provided a, a great variety and depth of comparative and descriptive results from studies conducted mainly 25 to 40 years ago. Do you know if any of those studies have been continued or repeated more recently, and do you see particular value in repeating some of those studies or expanding them in particular directions to see more contemporary data and perhaps begin to plot of more detailed trajectory of any, quote, evolution, unquote, that is taking place in these communities of native and introduced species? Uh, no, I, that's a very good suggestion. And I think that we could learn from repeating these surveys, repeating some of this work. To my knowledge, uh, there hasn't been anything uh, done further uh, to uh, repeat those sorts of measurements. And I think it would be very useful but particularly to our understanding about the question of succession. You know, maybe we'll end up with a novel plant community of eucalyptus, California Bay, and coastline hope that will perpetuate itself in time. But we do need more, more information. I'm Mount Davidson. Um, 
And you can look as far as there's a big debate about the ID, whether it's a good thing to have um, or whether it should be removed, whether the eucalyptus has actually increased the growth of ID. So I'm just curious what your take is on that. Well, uh, ID does grow up the trunks of eucalyptus trees. My experience primarily in the East Bay has been that it, it does not uh, succeed in, in uh, uh, <clears throat> shading out the foliage of the eucalyptus tree, but mainly on the uh, on the trunk. Uh, I looked at a few trees at Mount Davidson <coughs> that uh, uh, were reported to have succumbed to ivy. Uh, they all had been girdled with an axe or with a chainsaw, uh, and uh, so I think that allowed the ivy to then grow up to the tops of those trees and give the appearance that it might have killed them. But I've never seen any evidence. Uh, that it's successful in doing that. Have we learned anything from Angel Island and the elimination of so much eucalyptus followed by fires? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think there are some lessons learned uh, from Angel Island. Uh, that have maybe a little more to do with the administration of our park system uh, and uh, uh, the way in which decisions are made. Uh, I, I don't know of any follow-up studies. This goes back to the earlier question. You know, the uh, park district, uh, I think, uh, had an opportunity there to see what the effect uh, would be of the removal of those trees, which they, to my knowledge, that they have done no more work on the line. But it would have been a good line. Thank you for your talk today, Professor McBride. Um, of course, no uh, two eucalyptus stands are the same, right? So some are better for wildlife than others, I imagine, and there are different ages and whatnot. Um, some have virtually nothing growing underneath them, and some have a lot of invasive plants growing underneath them. Um, there's a question about ivy. If, uh, if, if there's a case where there's a eucalyptus stand which seems to be essentially favoring a few very invasive plants, uh, and, and that may include poison oak and native blackberry, which are you know, very, can be very aggressive species in our disturbed 21st century environment. Uh, would you say that we should consider managing that stand because basically all that's going on in those eucalyptus are a few invasive plants? Well, I, I have no prejudice against invasive plants. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an invasive California myself. <laughs> now, uh, I really you know, like the point you made that, you know, in many ways these eucalyptus plantations are unique among themselves. And I think, you know, that there are some serious fire hazard problems associated with specific standards that we ought to have a responsibility to address them. And, and I uh, uh, recognize that there are eucalyptus stands that have understories of invasive plants. Uh, and uh, that uh, I think should be measured against uh, the, the functional value of those stands. They may not be functioning very well as wildlife habitat. On the other hand, they may be uh, having a great function in terms of recreational value or in terms of wind rate. So I think we would, I would want to sort of look at a stand by stand, uh, plantation by plantation situation. I want to pick up on the, the comments someone raised about the proposed uh, clear cut of eucalyptus and a couple of other species from um, East Bay, from East Bay Regional Park District properties and UC Berkeley. Um, we're a group of people with disabilities who are opposing that clear cut on the basis that they're planning to use uh, massive doses of pesticides. And Many of us have been chemically injured by pesticides, and we see it that as a, a, a violation of our right to access those public lands if pesticides are used and bar us from entering them. Uh, so we see it as a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. But 
what we're struck by is uh, environmental, supposedly environmental organizations who um, position themselves as being opposed to clear cuts and announce that publicly as part of their campaigns, but who are actively promoting this particular clear cut. Uh, and I wonder if you could comment on that contradiction. That, that I would call that a hypocrisy. Um, I'm thinking specifically of the Sierra Club, but there are other organizations as well. Uh, it does seem a contradiction in you know their philosophy uh, to make a general statement they're opposed to third cutting, but then support uh, the wholesale removal. And uh, I you know uh, I, I share your concern over the widespread use of herbicides that would be required to deal with the crops. Like the trees and strawberries and, and, uh, right now I think that project is on hold. Uh, FEMA sent back to the university a list of 35 questions that they want answered before they're going to move forward to the next time. And I don't think the university is prepared to answer those questions because a lot of those questions we don't know the answers to. Mm -hmm. That particular proposal suggested that a lot of those trees would be checked and the chips would be stuck on the ground, and in some places, the chips would be two feet deep. And the first question that uh, Fuma asked was, how long will it take for that much eucalyptus uh, uh, mulch uh, to decay? And we don't know. I don't know anyone who's done any experiments to get an idea of that. But uh, that's a, a legitimate question. And so I don't know how, how the university is going to deal with this question. So you've seen the 35 questions? Uh, no, I've only heard reference to them. Oh. But they should be public, you know, uh, I don't think they're in any way confidential. Uh, we'll see if I can find, uh, find them. Send them to me or something different to me. Unfortunately, we have uh, time for one question. Uh, Jeff so you, if I, if I understood you correctly, you were saying that it's uh, inevitable, apparently, that the eucalyptus, um, like the citral forest in San Francisco, will ultimately become an old woodland on its own. Um, and I wonder if that, if that is the case, given that the weather uh, is so different on, say, Mount Davidson and on Mount Citro than in the East Bay, where it's so windy and foggy. And, um, but if you think that is the case, would it be uh, something the native plant advocates could say that, well, they're just helping Mother Nature along by um, clearing a lot of those trees now so those bays and laurels and all those other great native trees uh, will grow happily ever after? So. Uh, uh, I have not looked at the, the uh, <coughs> plantation above the, the hospital, the U.S. hospital. Uh, and I don't know whether any of those are these in there. Uh, that seems to be a long way from any natural culture. And as I recall when I was at Mount Davidson, I did not see any of those there. So those statements were made relative to parks in the East Bay. Uh, and and I, I expect that uh, some native uh, advocates would, uh, would see clearing the eucalyptus as speeding up this process, uh, which I'm not sure they're necessarily aware.